It was William has said a very, very hearty welcome to the meeting today. We're really glad to see you. And as we always say, the reason we're glad to see you, if you're not saved, is that you may hear the gospel again and trust Christ as your Savior and be sure of heaven and home when life's little day is over and past. You know, this is just the only chamber to eternity for us all. God has given us this time and his grace to prepare to meet our God. And this could be the day when you personally will put your faith in Christ, the only Savior, and know your sin forgiven, and know peace with God, and be assured when life is over and past that all is well for the world to come. That's what the gospel offers. I want to read today a portion of the Word of God I've never read when preaching the gospel before. It's been read many a time. I, I remember our brother Richard McCubbery reading it in the gospel before. But I've never read it before. And I want to read these words from Luke chapter 4 today. The gospel according to Luke chapter 4. I'll tell you why I'm going to read it in a moment or two. But here's what the Bible tells us of the glorious story of the Lord Jesus. Verse 14 of Luke chapter 4. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit of the Galilee. And without right a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went up into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this is the verse I want to think about today. The Lord Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in it, the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, and all bear him witness and wonder at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? The Lord Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. The recovery of sight to the blind, and the set of liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I don't know if there's anyone in our audience today who goes to the Methodist Church. I don't know if anyone who listens to us later goes to that denomination to hear the word of God preach. But you know, just in the last three or four weeks, I've listened to someone telling the story of John Wesley, the great Methodist preacher. You know, he came to the Arts Peninsula in about the year 1788, 1778, and he preached the gospel in Dercommon. He preached in Port of Ferry. He seen many people reached and saved across our land. And John Wesley was used mightily of God to preach the gospel to the conversion of half of England. He was a godly man with mighty power, and God was behind him as he preached Christ and him crucified. But what struck me was the man that was telling the story said that the first sermon that John Wesley preached after he was converted himself was from the text I've read today. I never have read Wesley's sermon. You can't read it if you want. And I never really, the man never mentioned or read the passage who mentioned this passage. But when I come home from work that day, I read these glorious words, and today I would like to interest you in the passage that John Wesley himself preached from, his first sermon after God saved his soul, and he went out to one another for Christ, and I think they're wonderful words of God's salvation in them. The Lord Jesus comes back to Nazareth where he was brought up, and he opens the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah, and he preaches these wonderful words of blessing to the people who heard him that day. And I want to preach it to you. I want to speak to you today about a gospel message that offers salvation 
offers liberation, offers deliverance, offers blessing to every soul. They will bow to the claims of the gospel and trust Christ as their own and personal Savior. My friend, here, here is the, the first thing I want to notice in the passage today. He said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And my friend, I want to thank the God of heaven today that we have a gospel to preach. Thank God there's news of salvation for every sinner that ever was born. There's news of salvation from the very God of heaven. A news of well, a message of welcome, news of blessing, news, my friend, that can bring salvation to the vilest, the guiltiest, the most unworthy. And if you're on the car today, not saved, still on your way to hell, thank God from the, our souls. And we thank the God of heaven, the author of this gospel, that there's a gospel to preach. Good news to be said today. Every soul of Adam's ruined race. There's a place in heaven for you. And Christ died for you. There's a son of God came into the world to save sinners. And the Lord Jesus came from glory to die on the cross. That God can righteously bring you into his family, forgive you your sins, and take you to heaven. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, to preach the good news. What a wonderful day we live in, my friend. There's salvation for every sinner who will take it. Christ's precious blood was shed at Calvary. And the sins of the world may be forgiven. That your sin may be forgiven. And we have a message of saving worth and saving grace to preach. A wonderful message of good news to men. Man find himself, finds himself alienated from God. The Bible's absolutely clear. There's a dreadful lot of bad news about man. Men are sinners. Women are sinners. All of us are sinners. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible solemnly warns us that a life lived in sin and a person who dies in their sins unforgiven goes to a lost eternity. Their precious personal soul lost forever under the judgment of God. But on the other hand, the glorious message of the gospel is this, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And the sinner who believes is free can say the Savior died for me, can point to his atoning blood and say this made my peace with God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, the Lord Jesus said, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. And my friend, it is our joy with a lot less power, certainly a lot less power than the Lord Jesus, and certainly a lot less power and godliness than John Wesley. But he likes the same gospel in your ear, that God loves you, Christ has died for you, and you can be saved for God so loved the world, and he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world, and there's salvation for every soul that will take it in true repentance today. If you're in the harbor worrying about your sin, thinking about eternity, Worrying about your soul, and you should be. Thank God, my friend, there's a glorious message, a wonderful message of salvation, a gospel to preach. It's not all about doom and gloom and judgment. It's about a Savior who came to, the, to redeem men from that, and they give them life and salvation and peace with God and an eternity in heaven. That's what is offered, that is why it's called. The gospel. But you know, he lists who he came to preach today because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What does that mean to someone? I wonder, is there anybody in the car today who has realized how impoverished they are in sin? No, it's just strange as you go around the country giving out threats and knocking people's doors. The many people who are still left they think they have something they can give to God to please him or to make them more acceptable in his sight. 
My friend, the sinner that believes, the sinner who gets to this point, and I'm an absolutely impoverished, rude, helpless sinner that has not anything to give God as the person who gets the blessing. He sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. I wonder if there's anybody in the car today and you feel your absolute unworthiness before God, your absolute sinnership before God. You couldn't lift your head. Uh, you know, all these things that are mentioned, if, if you were doing a Bible study, you could find the people mentioned in this little passage right through Luke's gospel. You know, one of the lot, whenever our brother David Ambrose preached here a week or two ago, he preached to a man who would not so much lift up his eyes on the heaven, but smote upon his breast. He realized how poor he was before God. He had nothing to give the God of heaven. Neither does any of us. Whenever the man of religion came to the Lord Jesus, Nicodemus by name in John 3, that man with all his religion, with all his Judaism, with all his works, with all the things that he had, the Lord Jesus looked into him in his face and he said, Nicodemus, you have nothing. You need to be born again. He came to preach the gospel to the poor. Because that's where sin has left us. Absolutely destitute of any good. Absolutely hopeless and helpless in ourselves. That's where my religion feels. We have nothing to give God. We are poor, ruined, lost, helpless sinners. You know, if you, in this very gospel, the prodigal son, and if you receive the blessing, sitting among the pigs in a foreign country, dressed in rags, he had nothing, empty, helpless, and hopeless in himself. He arose and came. What happened when he arose and came? He was welcomed with a thousand welcomes, embraced and smothered in kisses, because this gospel is preached to the poor. I have nothing to give God, says someone in the car park. I'm just a ruined, helpless sinner. That's what we all are, no matter who we are. No matter how good our lives is, without Christ we are impoverished, ruined, wretched, hopeless sinners. But the Savior came from glory to enrich us, and he who was rich for our sakes became poor, and we through his poverty might be rich. No wonder this is called the gospel, and it's preached to the poor. Is there someone in the car park today, and you feel your absolute poverty before God? You feel your nothingness and your emptiness. We point you to a full Christ today who can meet your needs, save your soul, fit you for glory, and enrich you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. He came to preach the gospel to the poor. He them that are broken hearted. You know, that's just where sin takes men. I wonder is there anybody in the car park today and you look back over a life and Satan has robbed you and ruined you and left you broken hearted and you have nothing to show for your life and you have nothing but a dark eternity to face for that is just what you have to face. I'm the same without Christ and makes no difference. We face eternity and all its dreadfulness, the blackness of darkness, the everlasting fire, hell with all its solemn realities and brokenheartedness and sadness and emptiness and weariness of spirit. He said, I have come to preach the gospel to poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Is there anybody broken because of their sin today? Is there anybody who feels and realizes by God's Holy Spirit, sin has left me destitute, sin has ruined me, sin has left me absolutely hopeless and helpless and ruined and brokenhearted. You know, the psalmist David, whenever he looked at himself, he said, day and night my hand was heavy upon me. Hezekiah said, for peace I had great bitterness. Oh, the brokenness of a sinner before God. Brokenhearted. Realizing the problem's me. The problem's my sin. The problem is what I am before God. And sin has ruined me. Listen, he has given a pre preach the gospel to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. I would be a poor meeting today if I was just up 
arming on and preaching about sin and ruin and wretchedness. But there's salvation to be had. Christ has came to give men life and salvation and peace and glory in heaven. There's no need, my friend, anymore. If you find yourself this way and you want deliverance, he has came to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken hearted. There is salvation, full and free, through the blood of Jesus, who on Calvary's tree shed his blood and fetched for sinners for the sky, yea, unto God it brings them nigh. Be it me to dwell with Christ on high. Through the blood, my friend, let me tell you, if you're broken hearted today about your law, about your sin, and you should be before a holy God, Christ has come to die to give you deliverance, to give you salvation, to make you and make you God's child, to bring you in and bless you, that you may no longer be under the cloud of mourning for your sin and its wretchedness. That's what it brings people to. We find people after people in our Bible. And you know, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Satan is the great deceiver. Oh, the sin of this world looks so pleasurable, so enjoyable, so fulfilling. And as soon as men touch it, just as soon as our, I'm going to say this from our Bible, just as soon as our first parents in Eden's garden took off the fruit that they were told not to take off, everything plunged into ruin, broken heartedness met them and hit them right away. Destitute and empty and void of the God that loved them, they were driven from the garden. Go watch their very children tell each other. And look where we're at today. It would, be too, it would take too long. Too much would be said about the utter wickedness of this world. Broken heartedness. He's come to preach the gospel to the poor. Anybody feel their poverty before God? It's good news for you. Anyone broken hearted about it? Oh, I would love to be saved. I'd love to be right with God. There's a gospel message for you today. Delivering for the captives. Not only, my friend, a gospel of the poor, not only a message for the broken hearted, but absolute deliverance. You can be saved and delivered today from the burden of sin. There's power in the blood. Will you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. And we preach today not only a gospel of the poor, and hope and help for the broken hearted, but absolute deliverance from the captives. You know, the Bible speaks about people who are, who are held captive by the devil in as well. Is that where you're at today? Years have passed. You cannot break the chains of sin. You cannot escape your own fallen nature, just a nature like I have. My friend, Christ's blood and Christ's risen power can. There is deliverance for the captives. An absolute setting free from sin. If only you would trust the Savior and rest upon God's way to heaven. Deliverance for the captives. Somebody said, Tommy, I would love to be saved. I would love to have what you men have. You can't have it well. Because we were just the same as you. Bound by Satan's chains and blinded by his power. Thank God for a day when we trusted Christ. And our chains were snapped. The bonds of sin were broken, and we were free. Oh, let the triumphs of his grace be spoken, who died for me. There's deliverance for you. Christ shed his blood at Calvary to pay the price of your redemption and salvation and emancipation. Christ at Calvary died, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. All that was demanded and the, and the sanctuary of everlasting holiness was paid in full and more beside at Calvary so that you could be free and delivered and saved and made God's child. He's come to preach the, the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken hearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. Don't wait under Satan's bondage anymore. Turn in true repentance to Calvary and trust the Lord Jesus and know what it is 
to no absolute deliverance from the bondage and power of sin. We're not preaching religion today. We're preaching God's salvation. It changes lives. It frees men and makes them God's children. And what was accomplished at Calvary was accomplished for you as it was for me and for everyone else. That you could be made absolutely free from your burden and drudgery and pain and folly of sin. And a dark eternity ahead if you nothing but the blackness of darkness and the everlasting burnings of an eternal hell. My Bible still speaks of, no matter what the religious world says, no matter what the theologians say, the Bible is absolutely clear that after a life of sin, there's an eternity of everlasting wrath. Christ died to save you from it. You've no need to go there. He came to preach. The gospel of the poor, the healing of the broken hearted, deliverance of captives, recovering of sight to the blind. I wonder is there anyone in the poor part today? And you have no thought in your soul about eternal things. The God of this age hath blinded the eyes of them, the minds of them that believe not. And you come to the gospel, you've heard it maybe from childhood years. And the thoughts of eternity and the reality of sin and the dreadfulness of the coming of the Lord. Are you not ready? Well, you have already mentioned it today. And you have no thought because Satan has done a good job at blinding you. You've heard the preaching of the gospel and you would know well and fine that heaven is only gained by the virtue of the Savior's blood and faith in him. But you have no eyes to see or ears to hear about it. Lord Jesus came for the recovery of sight to the blind. My friend, as the gospel's preached today, I would love that God's spirit would do what I could not do and touch that life of yours and open your eyes to see eternity's ages my soul has to face and blackness of darkness or riches of grace. Oh, that God's spirit would open eyes to see how you and I truly stand before God as wretched, ruined, hopeless, helpless sinner. And without Christ, we never be in heaven. But with Christ, we can't be there. That's why he died. That's why he came. That's why the Father sent the Son. That's why God in mercy reached out the fallen man when he was hopeless and ruined and gave his Son to do for us what could never be done by us. But Calvary, the Savior, died and shed his blood. Somebody says, listen, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to hell. I know I deserve to be there. And I don't know how to be saved. Oh, my friend, that you would receive the giving of sight to the blind. How many people we speak to over the years, and they've come as far as to acknowledging they need something and they need a change. But whenever you preach Christ and his full atonement, has full satisfaction for sin. People are still looking at you, wondering what they have to do. The covering of sight to the blind. If there's anybody troubled about their soul, they know that God's Spirit would give you eyes to see. And at Calvary Center Cross, what was needed to see in your soul was done, finished, completed entirely of what you and I could never do because we were the true sinners at the beginning of our reading. Christ came with all his might and dead and done and finished it entirely. And what man could never accomplish, he accomplished. Right, again, I'm going to quote words, done as the work would see us, over eyes to see it. Once done forever done, finish the righteousness that clothes the unrighteous one. When man could do nothing, God sent his son, Christ came. The work of salvation was finished by him. That men may be saved through what he would do for them and not what they would do for him because they couldn't do anything. And for eyes to be open, just to see at Calvary, my need was met by the glorious son of God. When he laid down his life, when he shed his blood, when he bore the wrath of God so that I may never bear it. A wonderful revelation when the eyes of a sinner is open to realize my hope for eternity is not based in anything to do with me, but upon him, the Lord Jesus, 
the Son of God, the only Savior, the only way, and the only hope. To set at liberty. Imagine being set at liberty. Someone, them that are bruised. You know, some has left many a mark in a man or a woman's life. We meet people as we go down sharing the gospel and trek form. And I am no emotionalist, let me tell you. There's many a door I walk away from. I want you to understand I'm not drawing any attention to myself with many of the silent tears yet when I see the results of sadness in people's lives. I look all that God has done for me. We are no more worthy than they are. The sin has left a bruise. Has it bruised your life? Has it left a mark and a dark stain and an emptiness and a shallowness and a sorrow? Lord Jesus came to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Well, there's one who loved you enough, my friend, to die for you in Calvary. He wouldn't bruise you. He would only help you. He would only bless you. He would only give you. He would only enrich you. Sin bruises, blackens, ruins. Destroy these men's lives and take them to eternal ruin. There's one who came to set at liberty them that are bruised. You know, you can imagine the chains bruising people's wrists and the present house of sin, soon to be in the present house of hell forever. He came to set at liberty, to give them life and salvation, to preach the acceptable year at our time is up. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What does that mean to stumble it? it? just means us, my friend. He came to do it. The day of opportunity was there, but gone with that day of Nazareth when he opened the book and preached the gospel to those people. Their acceptable year of the Lord. That has run a terrible long time. We're still here two millennium later. The day of God's salvation is now. It's the acceptable time. It is the day of salvation. All these things are offered and more beside to every soul who will trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. But to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, it's now people are offered the blessing. He may not be offered it tomorrow. The Lord Jesus, as William has solemnly prayed at the beginning of the meeting, may have come before another week. Where will your soul be? The opportunity to be saved will be taken away. Because you've heard the gospel and turned your back on it to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now is the time, O oh, then be wise, thou wouldst be saved. Why not today? Why are you waiting? What if what are you gonna gain by waiting? Christ came to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I wouldn't have any authority to say that, except he did it here. Preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Are you going to accept Christ the Savior? See, that's up to you. Nobody can force you to do it. If we could force you to do it, we can force you to do it. You would never be annoyed at us forcing you to trust Christ. Once you had him as your Savior, you would go on your way rejoicing eternally. And you would you would hug us for making you do it, but we can't. As a personal choice on your part. The acceptable year of the Lord is now. What you will do with Christ is your decision. These people made up their mind. If we'd read the story, they tried to push the Lord Jesus over the brow of the hell to his death as they could see it. No time for that message. We don't need that here. I don't know what your mind is towards the gospel. But if there's anybody who's any thought about their need of Christ, this is the day of salvation. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. We may not be here as William has prayed at the beginning next week. If the Lord could have come again, you must be very special people that you're going to go to heaven then if he comes back. My friend, we're no more special than you are. We just have trusted the sinner's Savior. And that's the only difference. I have taken my place as a wretched, ruined, blind, and helpless sinner and trusted the sinner's Savior. That's the only reason I'd be in heaven. I'm not half a hair's breadth better than anybody else. Neither is anybody else that goes to the gospel hall. We're only sinners saved by grace. And if the Lord comes back, we won't be here. 
the gospel won't be preached. Our religion will go on to be preached. And nice stories about God and all the rest of that rubbish. But the gospel won't be preached. And the way of salvation, the door will be closed. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. That's what he came to preach. And we would encourage you to trust Christ today. I finish with this. The eyes of everyone in the congregation were fastened on him. At the end of the day, my friend, that's what we want. Your eyes to be fastened on Christ. Don't be thinking anything about us. We're only a pile of failures, and we well know that. We're not here exalting ourselves or preaching about ourselves. We want your eyes to be fixed on Christ because we want you to be saved. And you'll only be saved through him and what he did. Nothing else saves the soul except the Lord Jesus. Every eye was fastened in him. You want to be saved today? Fix your eyes on Christ. He is the only savior, the only way, the only means, the only reason you'll ever be in heaven. But he is that way. He is that truth. He is that light. And salvation is offered to the whosoever will in him. He closed the book. Bible, the Bible theologians will tell you and readers will tell you. If you turn to Isaiah 61, where he read from that day, I think it's wonderful that the Son of God actually took a Bible from the hand of the minister and the Son of God and read the passage about himself. But it says he closed the book. Because if he had have read on, and everybody here who's a Christian will know this, if he had have read on, he would have read on about the vengeance of the day of our God. He closed the book before he read that. Because we are now in the day of grace. The day of vengeance hasn't come yet, but it's coming. And I can see a love in his heart as he closed the book or rolled up the scroll and handed it back. He didn't want to preach about the vengeance of our God. He had come to offer life and liberty, salvation and testing. He still is offering that. It's up to you to take it. And I pray you well. I pray that Wesley's sermon will be a blessing to your soul today. We close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessed words recorded for us in these Gospels and for the Lord Jesus who spoke them and for the grace of God that has come down the centuries and touched this little village far away from Nazareth and far away from the streets of Judea where he walked in all his perfection. And finally, you would give us life for every sinner that would ever breathe. We pray that someone today will think on these things and take the offer of the Gospel message seriously. Trust thy son. We thank thee for all thy grace in our lives, for grace it was, without it we'll be in hell for eternity and, and deserved every minute there. But we thank thee for one who loved us and gave himself for us. Part is worth thy blessing. If these things that William has mentioned in the news are true, bless broken hearted children, parents today, and loved ones. And may thy grace be with fallen and ruined humanity. What a mess God has made in this world. We think there is one who has come and will one day totally undo the works of darkness. In the meantime, may he undo it in people's hearts as they trust him as their Savior. We ask thy parting blessing the Savior's name. Thank you very much for coming. Sorry about the time.